Hello, this video shows a working example of chi-square test of independence. This type of non-parametric test answers the question, are two categorical variables related or are they independent? As with other non-parametric methods, we're going to use count data, that is enumerative data to describe the variables. We're then going to compare the observed outcomes to the expected outcomes to determine if there is a relationship or not using this chi-square statistic right here. If the observed distribution of outcomes is significantly different from the expected distribution, then we're going to reject the null hypothesis and uh, conclude that um, the variables are related which is what the alternative hypothesis here indicates. Notice that if the variables are unrelated in the sense of the null hypothesis, then it means that they are independent, hence the term test of independence. Now, as you're going to see, if we reject this null hypothesis, it means that knowing the value of one variable can help us predict the other in that they are dependent one on another. Alright, before we continue, I wanted to be sure you understood the difference between a chi-square test of goodness of fit, which I discussed in a different video, and the test of independence, which is a current discussion. Now, as I note here, goodness of fit test looks at a single qualitative variable, such as customer satisfaction. In this illustration, we might be interested in knowing if customer satisfaction is the same as or has improved from what it was in the past using the specified criteria. Now, chi-square test of independence, on the other hand, looks at the relationship between two variables. So here are some examples is there a relationship between gender and salary in the workplace. So here, for example, you might identify three categories of salary and then you're going to compare salary to gender. Break it into these two uh, levels. And does political party affiliation influence the political debate on gun control? So this is a burning issue here in America and uh, you can do a simple study designed in this manner. Are there differences in the quality of workmanship among the three daily shifts? So an operations manager might want to know if there is a relationship between the shifts, morning, afternoon, and night, and the level of work, three levels of workmanship, as I um, explain here. Uh, these are just examples. Is ethnicity related to the choice of a college major? Look at this. So you might identify three important categories um, of college majors, science, engineering, business, and then humanities. And then to see if there is a relationship between the field of study chosen and uh, the ethnicity of the students. Is a firm's involvement in corporate social responsibility related to the size of the firm? A good question, which I pursued in a recent empirical study. And here you might identify three levels of uh, corporate sizes based on their asset investments and then devise a method of um, determining corporate social responsibility involvement. So it's going to be binary, yes or no. And finally here, is there a relationship between a customer's age and the type of computer purchased? So as you can see, we can identify three types of computers and then um, compare the choice here to the age of the customer. And in all of these cases, the null hypothesis is that there is no relationship, as you can see here. So here's a quick working example, which you can pause this video and read up on your read on your own. And what we're trying to do here is to using um, the last example as a segue, we collected data on the type of computer devices purchased by 600 customers and as you can see here, 228 purchases were made of Apple computers, 204 Windows PC and 168 Chromebook. 
and on this column margin here we find that 396 of the buyers were aged 30 years and younger 204 um, older than 30 years so what you see here are the observed outcomes what you see here in black and the null hypothesis here is our age and type of computer purchased independent alright so now let's go ahead and crunch this up so in step one we're gonna calculate the row and column totals which I show here you already have seen those in red and then use notations to identify the uh, expected frequencies that we're gonna be calculating so now in step number two we're gonna calculate the marginal and joint probabilities or if you like proportions so marginal just simply means look at the proportional amounts at um, the column level and also at the row level so you can see that yes 396 buyers out of 600 are aged less than 30 years or younger which comes out to be 66 percent and it's gonna be 34 percent for those aged older than 30 and in the same vein you can identify the proportional number of uh, buyers who purchase the Apple product um, the Windows PC and finally Chromebook right here the task now is to determine the expected uh, proportion of buyers in each of these categories the black um, entries that you see here now to determine that I'm gonna go quickly to the next screen we are guided by the null hypothesis which is based on the argument that A and B are independent meaning that the two categories A and B age and type of device are independent in support of the null hypothesis and we're going to then base this on the multiplication rule for joint probability of independent events for those of you who had some uh, basic statistics prior to this but nevertheless what this rule states is that if two events are independent then their joint probability is going to be equal to the product of their marginal probabilities the marginal probabilities are those probabilities on the margin so for example for this entry in cell E11 I go back here this is cell E11 see E11 right here so E11 means first row first column see first row second column first row third column second second row first column second row second so forth. <laughs> all right so to get this according to this rule it's just gonna be the product of the marginal probabilities so 0.66 right here and 0.38 right here so it's gonna be a1 all right this is a1 and this is b1 and that's what you see right here probability of a1 multiplied by the probability of B1 and these are the values the 0.66 and the 0.38 so that's gonna give us 0.2508 which is precisely what you see here so for this guy here it's gonna be 0.66 multiplied by 0.34 and for this one here it is 0.34 multiplied by uh, 0.28 right so this is how we get the joint uh, probabilities as it were so and these represent the expected percentage of outcomes in each cell if in fact the two variables are independent so for example we should expect about 25 percent of the surveyed sample of 600 uh, respondents to be customers aged less than 30 with preference for Apple device and in the same vein we can expect about 9.5 percent of the respondents to be in the older age category and with preference for Chromebook alright so now alternatively by the way as I show in this slide coming up uh, now notice that E11 again is the uh, joint probability which we obtained by multiplying 0 0.66 by 0 0.38 to get 0 0.2508 alright so and what we're going to do is to then use these proportion use this proportion to determine the expected frequency so going back here here's our grand finale step number three the expected frequency so based on the 600 total respondents the number of buyers aged less than 30 or below to purchase Apple device is going to be 0.2508 multiplied by 600 so it's gonna be about 150 buyers and 
for those aged over 30, buying Apple product is going to be 0.1298 multiplied by 600, the total number of respondents, to get 77.52. So you do that for each of the remaining contingency table, which is what we call this. All right. So now what I try to show back over in this slide is knowing that all we did was to take the joint probability and multiply it by the total number of respondents to get the expected frequency. You can see that the expected frequency, sorry, the total number of respondents being 600 strikes out the 600. So this is actually going to be this total number in cell a1 multiplied by this total number in cell B1, B1 and then divided by the total number of respondents. So basically, if you multiply these two marginal numbers, 396 by 228, and divide by the total sample, you're going to get the same 150.38. So this is an alternative and quicker representation, which you might see in many textbooks. So by multiplying the joint, the marginal probabilities, and dividing by the total sample will fetch you the expected frequency. Over here, you can see that 204 multiplied by 168 divided by 600 will give you the expected frequency of 57.12. So now, again, this is our final product. And all we're now going to do is to compute our chi-square statistic. The chi-square statistic, looking at this, is simply the difference, the square difference between the observed frequency, in the first case 174, minus the expected, expected frequency of 150.48 squared, and we divide this by the expect, expected frequency in keeping with this formula right here. Again, this 174 is the number we observed from the survey. And if I go back real quick, I remind you that that's it over here. So this second one is going to be 54 minus the ex expected frequency of 77.52 squared. That's it right here. And then we divide by the expected frequency of 77.52 to get this. So that's how we're going to do it for each of these cells. And then we sum them all up. Look at it right here. And the total number, which is a chi of calculated chi-square statistic, is 22.53 we're done. All we got to do, compare this to the critical value of chi-square from the table. At the 5% level, it's going to be 5.9915. The critical value is based on the degrees of freedom of R minus 1 multiplied by C minus 1, where R is the total number of rows. And remember, we have two rows. And C is the total number of columns. Remember, we have three columns, 1, 2, and 3. So, 2 minus 1 is 1, 3 minus 1 is 2, 1 times 2 gives us 2. So with that, we go to a chi-square table such as this. This is 2 degrees of freedom. And the 5% level is going to be come over here, see, 0 0.05. That's your guy right here. That's your critical value. All right? And um, so as you can see, based on this, since our calculated chi-square exceeds the critical value, we reject the null hypothesis. Alternatively, you can also calculate the p-value, and you can use this Excel function, which, has de which I demo right here for you. So again, this is our calculated criti uh, statistic. This is the degrees of freedom. Now, using Excel function, this is what you want right here. So sitting here, I'm going to hit equal CH, and as I'm typing that, I see that already, the second one, double-click it, and it prompts me for the chi-square value I calculated, click on it, comma, it prompts me for degrees of freedom, click on it, and close parenthesis. It's pretty much zero, the p-value, and as you can see, if your p-value is less than the level of significance, that you have chosen, in this case 5%, you reject HO, you reject the null hypothesis. So our p-value is way out here. Now, by the way, you can also use Excel table built into the formula function. So right here, if you go to formula, and you, as I show you here, you go to insert function, and then you click on this chi-square, that's the function right there, and OK it. 
it prompts you for the chi-square value which you can click right here and click in here prompts you for degrees of freedom that's it there and click OK and as you can see it's virtually zero alright so same thing as you get over here if I go here and uh, push this up one little time alright so based on these uh, uh, on this outcome we reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the two variables customer age and the type of computer device are not independent